Well, hopefully you kept your Bibles open to Joshua 3, because that's where we're at. We uh, left off chapter 2 last week, and we want to begin taking a look at this amazing section of the book of Joshua that uh, begins to fulfill the very promise of, of our Lord. Uh, and it, in a sense, it's a rite of passage. It's a rite of passage for the children of Israel. Uh, every society has a rite of passage to some extent or another, and we could probably stop and think through what some of the rites of passages that maybe you experience as a, as a child moving from ch childhood to adulthood, what that is. Every culture has its own different rites of passages. I read about a few uh, this week, very interesting to me, one that's well known to probably most of us. The Jewish rite of passion is, is very uh, familiar to the world, bar mitzvah or bat mitzvah, uh, where Jewish boys and girls between the age of 12 to 13 move officially from uh, from childhood into adulthood, or at least seen as moving in that trajectory. And so that's well known in the parties and the ceremonies that go along with that. I read of another uh, rite of passage that is a little bit more unique or interesting um, from one of the Brazilian Amazon jungle tribes uh, known as the Satere Mawe tribe. It is deep in the heart of the Brazilian Amazon, and they have a different rite of passage that you might be thankful that we don't do here in America. At the age of 13, every single boy in this tribe goes through what is known as the bullet ant initiation. Now, I don't know if you know anything about bullet ants, but just let the name itself tell you something. If you've, if you've Googled it or watched any of those National Geographic shows, eventually you're going to talk about or hear about a bullet ant. The scientists tell us it's probably the most painful sting in, in the world when it comes especially to an insect. Uh, the venom in these things is phenomenal, and as the name would say, it, those who have been shot evidently and those who have been stung by this uh, particular ant say that they're one and the same. So keep that in perspective. The tradition goes as such. Uh, the men of the tribe search the jungle for bullet ants, which are then sedated and then submerged into an herbal solution, which knocks out these ants, and they're big ants. Knocks them out, so they kind of go almost in a dormant state. The ants are then weaved into gloves with the stingers pointed inwards with these grass. Actually, you can Google this. It's a pretty amazing video that's out on this very initiation. So the ants are weaved into the gloves with the stingers pointed inward. After an hour or so, the ants wake up angrier than ever, angrier than, angry because they were put in this thing, angry because now they're trapped in this weave that they can't get out of, and then they're further agitated with smoke. The men blow smoke on these ants, so they are raging mad. And so what they then have to do is, after all that takes place, each boy who goes through the initiation then has to put these gloves on his hands and he has to endure this, the pain, for 10 minutes without crying. If he cries, he has to start all over again and do it again because he's obviously not worthy to be a man. And if that's bad, each boy in this tribe goes through this 20 times within just a few months. This is crazy. And if the, if the boy passes these without crying, then he's now considered a man in this tribe of the Satere Mawe. Crazy initiation passage. Uh, 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 initiation uh, right. I wrote out another one. In Ethiopia, this is almost as weird. This is grooms to be. If you're going to get married in this tribe, you have to go through a certain initiation, right? And this is, if you're going to get married to a bride of this tribe in Ethiopia, then they have to jump over successfully a, uh, a castrated male cow with horns that is trying to kill you, and you have to do it four times successfully. And if you get hurt during the process, then you're not worthy to marry one of the brides of this tribe. Strange initiation. We're glad we don't have anything like that as well. 
And not to be outdone, there's an initiation in the little t island of Vanuatu in the South Pacific, and that's this initiation. Young boys who become men in this area have to jump off a 98-foot tall tower with bungee-like vines tied to their ankles and just barely preventing them from hitting the ground. But unlike a bungee cord that we would have today, the vine lacks elas uh, elasticity. And so it is absolutely crucial that the mothers and the fathers who prepare these vines have measured their son perfectly. Because if they've missed it, then you know what happens. And while the son jumps, it's the mom who holds something of the boy's childhood up to the child in a symbol of if he survives the jump, then they remove that childhood possession, and now he is a man. Well, those are bizarre, and we know those have nothing to do with being a man. And who knows what all the other initiation rites are when it comes to young ladies. But every society has initiations that we go through. It makes getting a driver's license a whole lot more benign, doesn't it? Uh, at least that was our initiation when I was in high school. Uh, once you got your driver's license, I mean, that was it, right? You were free. That, you were now an official adult, at least you thought you were. I don't know if there's others today. There probably is, but this is, in a sense, the children of Israel's initiation rite. It's a passage of sorts. They've been waiting for this day. They've been waiting to be a nation They've been waiting to be able to say that they have a home, that they have roots, that they can have cities and places that they can call their own. And they've been waiting for 40 years in the wilderness on this. And we know Joshua and Caleb have been waiting a whole lot longer than that. Some have been waiting just a few years because they were born during the wilderness. But Joshua and, Joshua and Caleb have been waiting a long time. And this group of people that's amassed on the eastern side of the Jordan River are waiting to pass through to their inheritance, to their promise. And I think that's really kind of what we have, this rite of passage here in this passage. God had promised the conquest to Abraham, as we've already noted, nearly 500, a little over 500 years before in Genesis chapter 15. And that promise has been repeated for centuries and been held on to. But now as we get to Joshua 3, it's finally here. One of the biggest moments of Israel's history is here. They can taste it. It's, it's palpable. And Joshua tells the people in Joshua chapter 3, verse 5, Consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. And we're going to be able to somehow get over this Jordan River and somehow we are going to be able to start going through the land and taking the land that is ours. And so in these several chapters, actually chapter 3, chapter 4, and chapter 5 really tell the story of this rite of passage, this, this moving from waiting into taking the land. And though it's three chapters, we're going to try to take them as a whole for the most part. And so obviously we won't be going verse by verse this morning. But at least we will see the whole story because it's meant to be seen as a whole, even though it's been divided up in three chapters. And even though there's these three chapters, there's three major events that we've read into chapter 5, which we didn't read this morning, but we'll look at very briefly. And the three major events here in these chapters 3, 4, and 5 is number one, the crossing of the Jordan. That's a big deal. And that is emphasized by the Ark of the Covenant. We'll look at that. And then the second main event in these three chapters is the erecting of this memorial, this altar of, of memorial, so that the children of Israel would remember what God has done. And then fourthly, we're going to see specifically in chapter 5, the renewal of the covenant, which is very important. And that is seen and emphasized by the rite of circumcision. And we'll see that in chapter 5. All that is taking place in chapters 3, 4, and 5. So three major events in the life of the children of Israel here. So let's look at them this morning. The first one we'll just simply entitle, The Ark of the Covenant. 
Because that is the emphasis, that is the focus. The ark is mentioned nine times in chapter 3, is mentioned seven times in chapters 4, and it's referred to at least four times indirectly in this passage of chapters 3 and chapter 4, just by use of the pronouns. It is critically important in the process of the children of Israel inheriting and going into the land. And as you would suspect and as you sense, this miracle that the Lord does on behalf of the children of Israel for them is directly parallel to a miracle that He has already done for His children, most of which are dead. But that was the parting of the Red Sea, of course, when they came out of Egypt in the great exodus. And it's meant to be parallel. It's meant to be synonymous. God chose this miracle purposely, and we'll see that. But the Ark of the Covenant is critical for our understanding of what is the Lord doing. And we ask ourselves the question, well, what's, what's so important about the Ark? Well, you know, probably, if you've been raised in the church or you're aware of any of the Old Testament law, that the Ark of the Covenant is the box or the chest that God commanded the children of Israel to make in order for Him to have a quote-unquote dwelling place among the children of Israel. The Ark, or the, the Ark itself, the Ark of the Covenant, was not a big box. It was specifically three feet nine inches long and two feet, three inches wide. So it wasn't that big of a chest. It was covered with gold, both on the outside and on the inside. On the top, the lid was pure gold. And you'll remember that on top of that golden, pure gold lid were two cherubim that were facing towards one another. And their wings were swept up and over, arcing, nearly touching one another in the middle. And this lid was known as the mercy seat and it was there that God was supposed to have dwelt among the children of Israel. It was a special ark. You know the story of Uzzah. You weren't supposed to touch the ark and he learned that the hard way. It was a holy ark. It was a holy chest. It was where God was. And in that space, there was that symbolism of the presence of Yahweh, God Almighty dwelling among his people. The ark carried by means of acacia wood that were put in two rings on each side, and that's how it was supposed to be carried. It was never to be touched by human hands because it was a holy, because a holy God represented in that ark. In fact, every time the Israelites moved while they were wandering through the wilderness, Moses, according to Numbers chapter 10, verses 35 and 36, Moses would say before they ever moved, he would say, rise up, O Lord, and may your enemies be scattered, and may your foes flee before you. And then the ark would get up, and they would follow the ark. And as soon as they would stop, after the Lord told them where to stop, then Moses would gather in front of the people, and he would say, return, O Lord, to the countless thousands of Israel. And it was there that they saw that God came back and dwelt there again with them once they settled down. So the ark was paramount in all that they did. It was central to who they were. And so a few important things for us to remember as we read through chapters 3 and 4 about the ark is why this ark is so important. And the first thing we are reminded of when it comes to the importance is that it represents God. And so therefore, as God has commanded Joshua here that the ark is supposed to go before them, it signifies for us that God himself went before the children of Israel. As must always be the case if any successful spiritual enterprise is ever going to occur. If there's ever going to be success in our spiritual lives, it's not because God's following us. If there's ever going to be strength and growth, maturity and development, success, if you will, in the spiritual life, it's because we are following God. It's true then, and it's true for us today. When God was ready, you'll remember when they first entered into the wilderness and they were getting ready to go into the promised land 40 years earlier, that God said, follow me, but they didn't want to. And then they found out their punishment by not following God, 40 days, or for, excuse me, 40 years of wandering, then they wanted to go, but God wasn't with them. And they resulted in a slaughter 
or devastation, disaster. The only proper way to advance anywhere or at any time is by following God's lead, God's direction, God's focus. Only God can give victory. And the very God who led Joshua was the same God who led Moses and worked through Moses. God here tells Joshua, I'm going to exalt you in front of all the people just as I did Moses. Remember, Moses was Moses the incomparable, as we saw in the latter part of Deuteronomy in chapter 1 of Joshua. So God is at work here in elevating Joshua as well because God is the one who is leading it. God is eternal. God is always the same. And the ark symbolized that God was the same in his power at the occasion of the passing of the Red Sea as God is now showing the Israelites in a new generation that I am the same God that part of the Red Sea, I will part this river and I will be the one to go before you. Clearly, the two miracles were intentionally parallel, as we've stated. God was no less sovereign on this occasion than he had been 40 years when he told Moses to raise the staff and the ocean parted. This is a monumental miracle in the life of the children of Israel and thus recorded for us in Scripture. In fact, I would say it's no less a miracle than the parting of the Red Sea. We'll see that in just a couple minutes. So the first importance of the ark is that God himself is there, so therefore God goes before. Number two, the ark symbolizes that God is holy. We've already alluded to that. Within the chest was this, of this ark were the stone tablets, remember, that God himself had carved out for Moses, the law, the moral law of God. That's where these tablets were, and they were kept in the ark. And the ark was the repository of the written expression of the moral character of God. You wanted to know his way. You wanted to know his will. You read the law that God had given. It revealed that God is not like us, that he is to be obeyed. His ways are right. And so it was a constant reminder the ark of the covenant was because the children of Israel knew what was in it. It was a constant reminder for them to remember that we go, the, the, the word of God goes before us and the word of God is holy. And it is an affront to violate his law, his word. Number three, the ark also symbolized God's justice. It was always in the presence of the ark that justice was meted out in the law. You'll remember in Numbers chapter 12 when Aaron and Miriam challenged Moses' authority because they thought that God spoke through them just as much as he had spoken through Moses. And you'll remember what happened. God said, you bring them into the tent of meeting. Well, what was in the tent of meeting? It was the Ark of the Covenant. And before the Ark of the Covenant is when God then smited Miriam with leprosy. Judgment happened before the Ark of the Lord. The whole picture of the ark is a picture of the justice of God. In the ark is the law, the perfect moral will of God. Over it was this golden cherubim looking down upon the law, constantly seeing that this law was being violated, was constantly being broken by a stiff neck and stubborn people, as Scripture tells us. In so doing, judgment has to happen. A holy God in the presence of and thus the ark was a constant reminder of the need for the judge of all the earth to always do what is right. And therefore, that's why justice was always meted out in the presence of the ark of the covenant. God is not just a holy God. God isn't just the God that goes before us, but he is a God of justice. Judgment always follows sin. It always has been that way. Ask Adam and Eve. It's always been that way. And it leads to a fourth reminder about the ark. The ark symbolized not just where God is, not just the fact that God is holy, not just the fact that God is a judgment-issuing God, but he's also a merciful God. It symbolizes God's mercy. The covering of the ark is known as the mercy seat because it was there once a year during the Day of Atonement. You'll know this, that the high priest sprinkled blood upon that very top of the ark 
the mercy seat. And it was there as those symbolic cherubim are looking down into the holy presence of God, a holy God, a judgment God, that that blood is being sprinkled upon, thus atoning for the sins of all the people. Before the priest did that, of course, he's already slain an animal, a calf, and that calf has been, been prayed over. Hands of the priest have been put on the head of that ox or that, that sacrifice. And the people's sins are deposited symbolically upon that. And then that animal is slain. And then it's the blood of that animal then that they carry into the Holy of Holies. Only the high priest could do this this one time of year in the Day of Atonement. And it was that blood representing the sins of all the people is sprinkled on the mercy seat. And we see here a substitutionary atonement. Paul calls it the wages of sin is death. That just summarizes the whole Old Testament law. And so in this way, the ark is a testament. It is a, it is a picture, a symbolism of the substitutionary atonement work of God. The fact that innocent victims' sins are covered and they're no longer seen as guilty because blood has been shed. And that blood has to be sprinkled. It has to be somehow associated with God. In the Garden of Eden, we saw the same thing when the God had to slay an animal to clothe Adam and Eve after their sin. A sacrificial atonement took place. We obviously see it. It all culminates in the glorious death of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The Ark of the Covenant, don't think of it as just a big block of, of, of gold. It had symbolism to it of who God is and what God was about and that would be insufficient if we didn't remember that it was a merciful God covering the sins of his people. This is the ark, and that's why it is so emphatically stated in chapters 3 and chapter 4, and that's why this ark has to go before them because it represents God, and they were to follow God in all of his ways. And so that's the ark. Well, there's a second major part of this three chapter story and that is not just is the ark primary but also the memorial is primary and we'll just simply refer to it as lest we forget memorial the lest we forget memorial this second event connecting the crossing of the Jordan River was erecting these memorial stones that were taken from the middle of the Jordan River obviously while it was dry and taken out and put on the land near Gilgal where they had camped Specifically, Joshua chapter 4, verses 4 through 7 tells us about this. The people needed a memorial because, like ourselves, they tend to forget. You and I tend to forget. It's not just what we don't know, it's what we just don't remember about the Lord in the times of difficulty, in the difficulties of life. We know God. Uh, you read scripture and you learn of God, but we have to constantly be in remembrance. And that's why it's so important. And that's why I believe the, one of the reasons why the Lord commanded us to not forsake the fellowshipping of one another, the, the, the life of being involved in other brothers and sisters in the life of the church is so that we can encourage one another on so that we don't forget what God has done. Because left to myself in my own home, by myself and all my worries and all my stress and all my anxieties, I do forget because I'm just like anyone else and my eyes get fixated on the issues, the problems. And brothers and sisters in Christ, the family of God is to help us keep our eyes fixed upon Christ, not the problem. Well, the same was true here. It's always been that case. The story gives three specific reasons why this memorial was supposed to be erected. Let me give them to you. The first was because the road ahead was going to be extremely difficult. Extremely difficult. This was not just going to be a walk in the park. And God is going to do great things, but he's going to do great things allowing the children of Israel to experience some suffering and struggle, just as he does to us today. If you've ever heard that come to Jesus and he'll make your life perfect, then you heard a false gospel. You heard a false gospel. He has promised that we are going to suffer. He has promised that we're going to go through difficult times. 
The road ahead would be extremely hard. There would be times, very soon in fact, that they will become more than discouraged. They will become flat out distraught. Where is God? How come he's abandoned us already? It just days into this campaign and he's already abandoned us. That's just the beginning. On and on it's going to go as the years go by as they take over the land. The text refers to this generation when it says in verses 5 and 6, And Joshua said to them, Pass on before the ark of the Lord your God into the midst of the Jordan, and take up each of you a stone upon his shoulder, according to the number of the tribes of the people of Israel, that this may be a sign among you when your children ask in my... In, Ask in time to come, what do these stones mean to you? Then you shall tell them that the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord. And so we see by returning to Gilgal, they were supposed to bring these rocks, these stones, and they erected it there at Gilgal because Gilgal became their base of operations during the entire campaign. They continually kept coming back to this place called Gilgal where they kind of adopted as their base of operation. And it was there that they were erected this uh, memorial so that every time they came back to regroup, to get more, new, new military assignments, they were to see this memorial and remember what God had done. That he had gone before us. He was faithful. He provided the miracle for us to come in. He is leading the conquest, not us. And so that's the first. There's a second, which is alluded to as there in verse 6 of chapter 4. And that's because children easily forget the faith and instruction of their parents. One of the things we're reminded about in Scripture is there's no such thing as as legacy Christians, meaning you're not a Christian because your mom and dad is a Christian. You're not a Christian because you grew up in a church. You're not a Christian because everyone in your family is a Christian, and I guess that's why I'm not Roman Catholic. Well, I, my family was Christian, so I've just always gone to a Christian church. That has nothing to do with being a Christian. Every Christian is a Christian by a personal act of, of obedience by confessing their own personal sins and asking the Lord to be their Savior, not because you grew up in a Christian home. And this is the same thing here. The reason is emphasized in the story, both at the beginning of chapter 4 and at the end of chapter 4. And here is elsewhere in the law, the people are reminded to tell their children about what God has done. Because if you don't, they're going to forget. They won't even know what that memorial stands for. And if I forget, I won't know what to tell them that that mem memorial stands for. And so it's very intriguing to me that here in chapter 4, twice, it's emphasized you raise this monument so that when your kids ask, what in the world is this for? And you can just see it. Hey, Dad, what's, what's, those, what's that altar for? Well, that's when God opened up the Jordan River and he separated it. He, he didn't do that. Yes, he did. Dad, that's impossible. He can't, no one, that, that could never happen. That's the point, son. God did the impossible to bring us into this land. This is our land. God himself is the one who promised, and God himself is the one who made the way. And we, that's why we worship Yahweh and not the gods of the Canaanites. Oh. Oh, well, maybe he's worth getting to know a little bit. And that's that point of parenting. And I would even say this, it doesn't matter how old your kids are. As if you're a parent, you still have an obligation to be directing your children to Yahweh and pointing them to God. N not, not making them feel good where they're at lest you lose them. God is your God. Christ is your king, not your children. Not your children. And they're not more important to you than God is. They can't be. God didn't pass, open up the, the waters for your children. They did for you. That's the picture. God is the one who is to be worshipped, not my family. And sometimes we get that so wrong because we're so worried about losing our families. Well, if I push them too hard, they're going to fall away. Who do you worship? What word of God is important to you? 
This is crucial, and I believe it has to be continually preached lest we forget because we're so easily, we so easily acquiesce to the world and to the wishes. Our kids, no matter how old they are, whether they're three or whether they're 33, are we still showing them Christ? Is he still worthy to be called my God? That's what this stone was meant for. We worship God because he's the one who did it. Don't be ashamed of your God. And maybe some of us need to erect our own memorials as to what the Lord did in our life so that we can point all those in our life to the fact that God is everything to me. Remember Rahab just last week? What set her apart? She was willing to put everything on the line for a God she had never, all she heard about. This is the kind of faith that makes it into Hebrews 11. This is the kind of faith that Jesus himself said, hey, I, I don't play second fiddle to anybody. I, I didn't come to bring peace. I came to bring a sword. Accepting me as your Lord and Savior is going to cause issues in your earthly relationships. But am I worth it? We're learning that in John chapter 6, even as we study that on Wednesday nights. Jesus, after sharing the fact that he is the bread of life, has to turn because all the disciples now are turning away because they don't want to follow that. that he's starting to get a little too hot and heavy. His, his, his demands are a little bit too extreme. And so he turns to his personal 12 and he says, are you guys going to leave too? And it's Peter. You'll remember Peter's response. Lord, where do we go? You alone have the words of life. We can't follow anyone other than you. We know that. Because they learned that because they learned to worship and believe who Jesus actually is. He's God. And so even going through the book of Joshua, we're reminded, who do I worship and who do I memorialize in my life? Who's more important to me by the end of the day? And don't be deceived, brothers and sisters. God is not mocked. He knows our hearts. There's a third reason why this memorial is supposed to be built, and it's because it's a testimony to the existence and the nature of the one true God. That's obvious. The last verse of the chapter strikes this note in verse 24. So that all the peoples of the earth may know that the hand of the Lord is mighty and that you may fear the Lord your God forever. Oh, that that would be something that could be said about every one of us on our tombstones. Remember what Paul said to the Galatians? That I might know him? Over in, in Galatians chapter 1, just thinking about this, let me just read it to you. It's such an important uh, verse. He said, if, I, if I'm still seeking the favor of man then I'm not a bondservant of Christ. Galatians chapter 1. He said in verse 10, For am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Or am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. Same truth. Same storyline. God is to be remembered and to be worshipped and followed in obedience. He is the Almighty One and that the whole earth might know and fear the Lord your God. You see, the children of Israel were truly supposed to be witnesses. That's not just a New Testament concept. The, the, God was giving the children of Israel this land, this rite of passage they're going through so that they might be witnesses to the nations. We're not like you. We serve a greater God, and he is worthy of all worship. Well, let's wrap it up. Number three, not just do we see the Ark of the Covenant through the actually passing of the Jordan, the erecting of the memorial, which signifies the fact that the Lord is to be remembered in all that he does. And so future generations themselves we can point to and say this is what the Lord has done, not us. And lastly, consecration, and that happens in chapter 5, and it's very unique. 
this third part of the story. God wants his people consecrated. He already said it back in chapter, five, verse, uh, chapter 3, verse 5, where Joshua says, Consecrate yourselves. Tomorrow the Lord is going to do wonders among you, and he did. And now they've passed over the Jordan. They've gotten through. They've gotten their stones. They've erected this monument in Gilgal. And now what does the Lord do? Well, let's stop and think about it for a minute. We, we already know. Look at chapter 5, verse 1. As soon as all the kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan to the west and all the kings of the Canaanites who were by the sea heard that the Lord had dried up the waters of the Jordan for the people of Israel until they had crossed over, their hearts melted and there was no longer any spirit in them because of the people of Israel. That means they didn't want to fight at all. They were done. They knew the fear of God literally had come upon them and they were petrified. We know that. Rahab's already told us that in chapter 2. The awe that had swept over this country is unlike anything we've ever experienced personally in our lives. Now, what would you do if you're the military commander? When's the time to strike? When no one wants to fight. They don't even want to pick up the sword. They're so scared of us. Let's go. Well, that's what you and I would do. That's not what God does. Isn't this interesting? When the fear of God is over them, God calls for all the men of Israel to be circumcised. Now, we're not going to get into the graphic details of that, obviously. But you'll remember back in Genesis 34, when we have a picture of what happens when a whole group of men are circumcised, they can't, they can't do anything. In Genesis chapter 34, Dinah, the sister of Simeon and Levi, remember, had been violated by Shechem. And so they, they, in a deceitful way, made that little alliance, and then they had all the men circumcised, and then literally just two men, Simeon and Levi, went in and slaughtered all the men of the entire town. They couldn't do anything. The Shechemites had been incapacitated by the rite of circumcision. And it was precisely this rite that Joshua now inflicts upon his own troops in the very presence of Jericho, the mightiest military fortress in the area. What are they thinking? This is absolutely crazy. On one hand, this is the, most, this is the moment Israel should have attacked the Canaanites because of the fear of God. They didn't want, they had melted. They, they didn't have it in them to fight. It would have been easy victory on their own. On the other hand, if the Canaanites had any idea what Joshua has just done to all of his forces, what do you think they would have done? They would have attacked in a heartbeat and just annihilated the Israelites. They didn't know. Humanly speaking, in other words, the actions of the Jews here in chapter 5 is absolutely utter folly. It makes no sense at all. We would call it stupid. Bad timing, Joshua. There's, there's got to be another time when you can choose to do this. Mm -mm. God's priorities are not our priorities. Meanwhile, the Canaanites, while the children of Israel were over on the west side of the, or excuse me, the, the east side of the Jordan, were terrified of the Israelites, but they thought they had time because Scripture tells us the, the Jordan is in flood stage. Did a little research on that. It's absolutely fascinating. The actual Jordan Valley between the Sea of Galilee and the Dead Sea varies in breadth from 3 to 14 miles wide. Within this valley is the river's floodplain, which is 200 yards to one mile wide. The floodplain was packed with tangled bushes and what is referred to as jungle growth. That's right, that's what it's referred to even in Israel. It's like brambles and such that you can barely get through. Hence, it's not the river so much passing as it is all that jungle-like stuff that's difficult to make it across. The fords of the Jordan being as much like they would be as a jungle. And then there's the river channel itself, which is similar to 20th century conditions, this um, almanac told us. It ranges between 90 to 100 feet broad, with a depth anywhere between 3 to 12 feet. 
The current was strong during this time of the spring because the drop of elevation, which is a drop of 40 feet per mile near the Sea of Galilee and an average of 9 feet per mile overall. That means it's always a fast-moving river. In flood stage, it was impassable. So do not think the Jordan River is like the pictures you see in your little almanac books or your, or your Jewish custom books. And you see this little, and then a couple sheep over on the side. That's not the Jordan River, not the one that they pass. This is like, we can't get over this. Not a million people. That's impossible. What are we going to do? Thus you see, this is not just any miracle. This is a massive miracle. The river Israel is faced with in springtime was no placid stream. The Canaanites thought they had time. So they're just planning away, but they're scared to death. What does God do? Well, not what worldly wisdom would say to do. We would attack. Nope, God says, I want three days of rest. You're going to do nothing. In fact, you're going to be incapacitated for three days. You wouldn't be able to defend yourself if you wanted to. Three days delayed. And meanwhile, during that, he institutes the Passover. On top of all that, what's, what's God doing here? He just entered them in, just with a tremendous miracle. The, the, militarily, it seems as though it's at their taking. The wisdom of God is not human wisdom. It's far more important to our God that the hearts of the people be right with God than that they gain a momentary military advantage. And let's translate that for us. It is far more important to God that your heart is right with Him than anything else you ever do. He wants your heart. He doesn't just want your actions. He doesn't want your money. He doesn't need your money. He doesn't need your time, which is another way that we like to get by giving to the Lord. He wants your heart. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. Love him with your being. Do you really love him? Is he everything to you? This is what the Lord is, is demanding of his people here. Before you go into this land and you get to benefit from the promise I gave 500 years ago to Abraham, and you're the ones who get to possess this land, that you're going to inherit cities you didn't build and, and vines you didn't plant. Before that, you need to remember who I am, and you need to consecrate yourself and be holy before me. One of the reasons why the church, let alone it was the resurrection day, we, we no longer meet on Saturdays. We meet on Sunday. It's the first day of the week. It's the beginning. We don't give God the last day of the week. We give Him the first day of the week for His glory and our good. This is what the Lord demands of His people then. And if that bar seems high, just know that the New Testament doesn't lower the bar. Grace never lowers the bar. Grace always elevates the bar. Circumcision was the mark of a covenant, a covenant with God. They hadn't circumcised the men during the wilderness wandering, so God said, you're going to get right, you're going to follow what I told you to do. It signified membership in the covenant people of Israel, just as baptism does for the church. The first command God gives his disciples is to be baptized it signifies I am a part of the body of Christ, a divine seal on those whom God has chosen to be his people. Passover that was instituted here is the observance here in verses 10 through 12 was a meal of remembrance of what God had done. Again, it's not us doing it. The Lord's Supper for the church is exactly that. So God is giving them a circumcision and Passover here. He's given the church baptism in the Lord's table. Remember what I have done, the Lord says. Remember me. That's what communion is. We'll celebrate that together next week. It is a, it, it, it is a memorial stone, an altar of sorts where we reflect what Christ has done so that we don't forget. 
we don't forget that we're here by the mercies and the grace of God, not ourselves. Oh, the Lord's not impressed us going to church. The Lord is not impressed with, with golden stars on our little stickers. God wants our heart. We learn that lesson here in chapters 3, 4, and 5 of this story illustrated for us in Joshua of God giving the, the, the nation of Israel this rite of passage into the land. And, and the conquest hasn't even begun yet. But before all that takes place, there has to be some consecration takes place. Our ways are not always God's ways. We know that. But what we do is critically important. Of course it is. Jesus himself said, don't tell me you love me if you don't do what I've told you to do. But it's not just what you do. That is important, but that's not all. What we are is as, if not more important than what we do. Because if you are a worshiper of the Lord, you're going to want to do what he's told you to do, and no one's going to have to force you to do it. And this is what is acceptable and pure worship before the Lord. Would you bow with me in prayer? Our Father, we confess this morning we're struck with your grace and your mercy, your power, your magnitude, your faithfulness, your steadfastness. Yet, Lord, we're also struck with the fact that you are indeed a holy God, a God of judgment indeed. You're not a God that can be mocked. You're not a God that can be, have one pulled over on you. You know our motives perfectly. You know why every one of us are here this morning. You know us. And we just simply confess and we ask before you, help us. Holy Spirit, consecrate us. Set us apart. If you see any wicked way in us, then lead us in an everlasting way and forgive us, O oh God, of our sin. Wash us thoroughly from our iniquity and cleanse us from our sin. Oh, make the bones of which have been broken. Lord, may they rejoice in you and grant us, Lord, the joy of your salvation. And fill us, Lord, we pray, with your spirit so that we might keep in step with you, that we might honor you, not just because of things we're doing, but because of who we are. We know this is what you want. A broken and contrite heart you will not despise. And so take us, not just our actions, but take us whole. Take our heart, take our mind, take our wills and possess us so that we might truly be vessels fit for your glory and useful for the expanding of your kingdom until you come back. Oh, this is our prayer. Thank you, Father. In your name we pray it. Amen.